Thanks for tuning in to Heartland Baptist Church in Ames, Iowa. We are a gospel preaching, Bible teaching ministry that does our very best to share God's great message of hope to all who will hear. We live stream our Sunday morning and evening services each week so that no matter where you are, you can hear great Christian music, practical life-changing sermons, and show honor to the God who made you, the Lord Jesus who loves you, and the Holy Spirit who wants to help you. Whether it's our Noah's Ark ministry for little kids, the Bible Land ministry for elementary, teen ministry, young adult ministry, young family ministry for parents with kids at home, adult ministries and senior citizen ministry, we care about the whole family no matter what generation you're in. We love uplifting Christ-honoring music, lots of fellowship, special Sundays, holiday celebrations, church picnics, sports, VBS, outreach events, and of course, sound preaching and teaching from the scriptures. We actively seek to share how to be saved to the lost, offer fellowship to the lonely, help for the hurting, and hope for those who are struggling. If you live within driving distance, one of our pastors is happy to meet with you. But even if you don't, they're glad to chat on the phone or to email with you and offer biblical advice. And we don't just try to reach those in Central Iowa, but have an active missions program, supporting dozens of missionaries around the world, along with many ministries here in the States. If we can help you in any way, just let us know. And you are invited to visit sometime or join us online on a regular basis. We love you and know Jesus loves you that God has a wonderful purpose for your life. Here's our service. In that very moment when you try so hard but fail, your own strength betrays you, so you moan and weep and wail. Haunted by some big mistakes you think will do you in. You don't even get a hope that losers ever win. Meanwhile, God is working all things for your good. Meanwhile, He is doing what you never could. Impossible, improbable. Just his son, wait and see what God is doing. Why? Well, God is up to something, even though you may not see. His ways are much higher than we ever could believe. There will still be rainy days that seem to never end And nights that seem so dark and cold that doubts come creeping in Meanwhile, God is working all things for your good Meanwhile, He is doing what you never could Impossible, improbable, well, that's just His style Wait and see what God is doing meanwhile. Meanwhile, God is working all things for your good. Meanwhile, He is doing what you never could. Impossible, improbable, well, that's just His style. Wait and see what God is doing meanwhile. Wait and see what God is doing meanwhile. Wait and see what God is doing meanwhile. He is a great and a mighty God. And would you stand with us please and let's sing to him about the amazing grace he has provided for you and me. Who brings the power of sin and darkness. Who shakes 
I'm glad you're having fun with that. Make your way back to your places if you would. Would you jo join this old Swede in singing our next verse together, please? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of love, all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King of all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take. worthy and able to pay that price. He is the King of Kings. Sing together. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Missionary Tan 
uh, Dwayne and Tammy Wright, uh, our missionaries to Ethiopia. And Dwayne, why don't you come on up, and uh, you're going to pray in Amharic. And uh, yeah, see, I only had to say that in English, so that was a uh, tongue twister for me. So if you'll take us to the Lord in sure. prayer. Let's pray. Salut geta, Xavier hoi sil fikinem, enamasagan alin. Berkatoch talak nachu, yitinim, beta Christian anta abaraku. Be betim, wust, melkum geze, sitin, yumagnagara, kal atin sitin. Xavier hoi itchin haga, anta baruk. Ethiopian, anta abarak, beka beta Christian, be yasusim, amasagan alin geta, be beta geta, be yusesum, amen. I just pray God bless this church, continue to use this church, continue to bless Ethiopia, and that others may hear about Christ. Thank you, Dwayne. You guys may be seated. Uh, if you're a guest with us here for the very first time, we'd ask that you uh, fill out one of the communication cards there in the seat pocket in front of you and drop that in the offering plate or take that to the Welcome Center when you leave. If you're a guest online, if you'll let us know by leaving a comment saying hey to us or the information that's provided there, contact us that way. Well, this morning, as you know, we've been over the last few weeks raising funds for our missions project, a missions project offering. And those were going to go to four different projects. And our goal was $20,000. So get ready to praise the Lord, okay? We raised $24,000 for the four projects. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, we wanted to share with you uh, some of the pictures where those actual funds were going to. So the first missionary that we were raising support for were the Bryans in Zacatecas, Mexico. And the Bryans planted a church there in Zacatecas. They also have an orphanage that um, a lot of these children can go to, and they just wanted to say thank you. There's some of the faces that you were able to help, uh, and that'll go for different uh, remodeling projects inside the orphanages, just some uh, basic needs of the orphanage. So thank you for that. And then we have the Salmons in Thailand, and they are going to start a brand new work. So they've actually been over there working in another church, and now they're going to launch out and start their own they have the, the map picture here shows you uh, in the green. You have two locations that they're choosing from, and both of them are in main thoroughfares. So the first one that they're looking at is the mall. And if you notice all of the, um, the power lines that are going through there, that's what jumped out to me first. But that would be inside the mall, and that's one location they're looking at. The other is an international um, school that has been vacated, and they would go in and then start the church inside of that facility. And so they're trying to figure out what the Lord's will is and, and where the Lord's leading them to do that, but that's going to help start just purchasing chairs, purchasing everything that they might need to start that new work there. So, um, And then we have Baptist Bible College was a third project that we were raising money for. This is where many of those that stand before you on staff have gone to school, and uh, so it's very near and dear to our hearts, but this goes to help classroom spaces for other students that will be coming along and stepping into ministry. And if you remember, we have four students currently enrolled there, and I think we have one more that might be on our way, so i uh, excited about that. They'll be able to experience this. This is one of the hallways in one of the wings there at uh, Baptist Bible College, and then you can see the classrooms that they're already making use of some of the space that have uh, funds have come in for and provided for. And one of those classrooms is very, very special to me because when I was a teenager, I went and visited Baptist Bible College, and that classroom right there is where God called me to become a pastor. And so I'm super excited that we were able to have a part in just kind of bringing it up to the 21st century and having nice uh, equipment and desks and, and things like that. And then our last project goes to our, our friends, uh, Dwayne and Tammy. So Tammy, why don't you come on up? And I'd like to present this. We were raising funds to help them purchase land for their church. And this morning, we have a check for $6,000 for you guys to go for your church. So praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. 
Dwayne shared with me how that his vision for the church, and it's just a unique, great vision that uh, we are going to be able to have a part of. So next time you're with us, we'd love to see the pictures and love hear the stories about how God's using those funds to, to help you in your ministry. And, but there's more. There's <laughs> one more. We have a very special gift from our children's ministry, and Pastor Mike Baumgarten, who leads that ministry, would like to just present you to this. All right, so each BBS, uh, we always have an offering where the kids compete uh, to, you know, boys against girls, who's going to give the most? And this year, they gave so well that uh, Tammy and Dwayne, we want to present uh, from the children's ministry a big old honking check for $500. <laughs> hey. <laughs> All right. Here, come on over here. Keep going. Yep. Stand right behind her. She wants to take a picture. They were so eager uh, to bring that check in. I was like, oh, just hold on, hold on. Okay, is this good? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, there may be a, a little issue here. I don't think the bank will, will check that one. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but they will this one. Hey, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Amen. You, guys. Thank you. Come on up. you probably don't know that. That's just how the church pays all the staff. We get a check like that every month. It's, it's so hard. Uh, Dwayne, you, you left me. I, I need you, buddy. Tammy, you can come on back up, too. We, we like to sing in uh, uh, the language of a missionary who's visi visiting one of our songs. So today we're going to do God is So Good. Sean, could you put the first slide up? And so you can see the, the picture at the top is the actual language of uh Yeah, see, I'm not going to even try that. And then underneath, you recognize that as English, yes? Good, isn't it? Okay. Some of you are looking at it like you're not sure. And underneath the yellow, that is the phonetic that we're going to be using to sing the song. And so how do they pronounce that so they're in front of that? Geta Melkam No. Okay. Go to our next slide so they see the other line. And, and then Geta Melkam No, Melkam No Lenny. Okay, so yeah. see, it just repeats. We're going to sing yeah. that a few times through so that you can get that. You all know God is so good. Go ahead back to our first slide, Sean. Let's sing that together, all of us together, in Ethiopia. And Am Herrick. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> Let's sing together. Geta melkam no. Geta melkam no. Geta a hand for helping us out. <laughs> and just before he comes, let's sing your grace is enough. Isn't his grace enough for you and for me? It's wonderful that he provides grace after we're saved. That grace that saves us is wonderful. But his grace is enough for all of my Christian walk. So let's sing together. Praise is your faithfulness, O oh God. So with the sinner's heart, you lead us by still waters into mercy.
Morning. All right. Well, I hope you're all awake, all right, because in Ethiopia we have some fun at church, and I hope we can have some fun uh, here with you this morning. What's unique in Ethiopia is we always greet uh, with people on the street, uh, all right, and so that means, has God blessed you? And they were in turn, Dana and Izabi Meskin. God is blessing me, blessing my life at this time. And what's unique about the Ethiopian culture is they will do that three times. So you'll be in the middle of drinking coffee and you're conversating, no big deal, God's blessing me. And then you carry on, how are the kids? Kids are doing well. Are they doing well? They're doing great. And they ask that three times. And their idea is on the third time, you're actually going to tell the truth. All right, you know, and on the third time, is God blessing you? Are you doing well? Well, not really. Let me tell you really what's going on. And uh, so, Dimonadrachu, I won't ask you three times, but if I stop in the middle of the sermon, maybe by the end of the sermon, you'll be able to tell me exactly how you really feel at the end of the sermon. It may not be all that great, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, but, man, on behalf of my family and I, we want to say thank you for allowing us to be here. What a great blessing of helping us with the land there, and I look forward to sharing updates with that uh, with you guys as we continue on. Uh, this morning we're going to look in John chapter 6. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 6. And now don't let this scare you. In Ethiopia we go for services for quite some time. I'm not going to run over your lunch hour, all right? We will get you out of here in time. Uh, so, uh, you know, they say when you have the mic, you have the menu. And so we'll take care of the menu. But does this look familiar to many of you here this morning? All right? Some of you, your memory is now being flooded uh, with, with memories of growing up. Or, or maybe you used one in your time of workforce. And my dad is a, <clears throat> is a blue-collar worker still to this day and always has been. And, and I remember as a kid, my dad would take this lunchbox. We'd get up for school early in the morning and getting ready for school, running around the house. And dad would go into the living room and he'd strap on his boots. And mom was in the kitchen and she was packing dad's lunch in the lunchbox. And, and, and it was always, you know, some cookies that she may have made or brownies that she put in there. And, and my dad, if I can remember right, always, always had one of two sandwiches. He either had fried bologna and tomatoes on his sandwich or he would have this stuff, and someone had given me the name, but I can't pronounce it. It's like a, in a yellow tube, just kind of smashed in there, and you slice it, and he can smear it. That's it. That's it. It's nasty, all right? Yeah, that stuff's nasty. And, and so those were, I think those were the, like the only two sandwiches my dad ever packed for lunch. And, and he would come home. We, of course, we'd be home from school before he got there, and and we'd run, my siblings and I would run to the lunchbox, and we'd hurry up and open it up and look in there and thinking, man, I hope he didn't eat all mom's cookies or all her brownies. And there was that sandwich of whatever, that sandwich, you know. And we're like, oh, man, just disappointment. And, you know, and, and, you know I think sometimes in our life, in our Christian life, we sometimes open up our lunchbox in disappointment, don't we? And what I mean by that is we, we put in our lunchbox, we carry around with us the things that we think we're good at, whether it's our education, whether it's our finances, it could be our talents, it could be our past, some past experiences, some past decisions we made that we're not so happy with or we wish we could have done different, and, and we carry those around with us throughout our life. And, and I think sometimes when God starts looking at us, and, and starts working in our life to move us or to do, have us do something greater than ourselves, we always come back to the lunchbox and we always go back to what's inside. But God, I don't have enough. God, what I have isn't all that great. It's, it's just a fried bologna sandwich. There's not a whole lot in here. God, you can't use me because of the baggage I carry, because of the things I don't have. You need, God, you need one of those guys who are, you know, are the, the Charles Spurgeons or, you know, the great theological men and women. And you need people like, but God, not ordinary me. And if you look in John chapter 6, and, and, and but before we get there, you don't have to flip over. But I'm always intrigued as I read through Scripture and I come across Hebrews chapter 11. And if you grew up in, ch in, faith, in, in church, that's the hall of faith chapter we always call. And you think about the people God has put in that hall of faith. I mean, you think of Noah and the ark, and, 
Man, I don't know about you, but when our first son was born, we decorated the nursery in Noah's Ark. And as we travel to churches, there's always the kids area that's, you know, decorated in Noah's Ark. And there's the two by two. And man, we read the story. Look, there's Noah and the animals and the boat and the rain and the rainbow and all these fun things. And, but we never read the part where he gets off the boat, do we? Where he becomes a drunkard and does things he shouldn't. We close the book before that. And then we come across the guy in, in Hebrews chapter 11. He's an Old Testament guy. And, and we can't say his name without tagging who he whipped up on. And David and Goliath. Man, you got a good preacher, man, because he's teaching you some Bible there. But, man, we think of that. We're like, and, and we use that in sports today. You know, David's going to topple Goliath. And, you know, and, and look, he's a giant and what God did. And, but you remember David when he climbed up on top of his rooftop and he saw Bathsheba and he committed adultery? which led into committing murder, and God said he was a man after his own heart. And then the last one, it, there's many in there, the one that really just always trips me up is the story about a, an Old Testament lady, and she was helping the, you know, some of God's people to get away, and, 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 we, we, and even in Hebrews chapter 11, God left this, this vocation, her occupation, with her name. And I'll say her name, Rahab the harlot or the prostitute and sometimes I read Hebrews chapter 11 I'm thinking God you wrote that why didn't you leave harlot out why did why did you keep it in there and you know what that's just discouraging to so many that's that's offensive to our churches today and I can't help but think that possibly that God left that in there to show every one of us here this morning that he can use anybody with anything with any past with anything in their lunchbox, to do things greater than themselves. And so our story today in John chapter 6, we come across another great story with that aspect. And if you'll allow me the liberty as we scroll, read down through uh, the verses, I'll stop every now and then. You'll learn really fast, man, that missionary is ADD or ADHD. I don't even know which one I have, but I think it's one of those, you know, where I just, I just went all over. I'm just thinking of other things now. Here we go. Verse 1, back to the notes. Chapter 6, verse 1 of John. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him. Now, if you know, if you've been reading through the scriptures or you know much about Jesus' life, there was always three different groups of people that are always mentioned. There was the group that followed him that believed he was the Messiah. They believed he's the Savior. They believed he came for them and to rescue them. And so that group would follow him. You know, we say they're the disciples or other believers that followed him. And so there was that group that followed him. Then there's another group. They saw the miracles he did, but they didn't believe he was the Messiah. They couldn't cross that line yet. There wasn't enough evidence. But they would still follow Jesus because they had seen the miracles he did in another town. And man, it, I'm with you. If, if you have children and your children are sick and it's like there's no other hope and you've tried everything else, you are trying to do everything that's recommended to you or asked of you or even anything. And so this family or this group of people would follow Jesus in hopes that Jesus may do a miracle in their life, in their family, like he did in a town in the past. And that's this group. And then there's the group that would follow Jesus. They didn't even believe he was the Messiah. Matter of fact, they wanted to catch him doing things on the Sabbath so they could arrest him and have him you know, put in prison. As we see later on in the story, that takes place and he's crucified. So in the story in verse 2, And a great multitude followed him because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. So this group doesn't believe in him as the Messiah. They believe, they've seen him do things, but they're just checking him out now. And Jesus went into the mountain. And there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jew, was nigh. And when Jesus lifted up his eyes, when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him. Pause there for a moment. Picture this. The, the 5,000 was down around the lake. There's 5,000 plus women and children. The disciples are now with Jesus up on the side of this hillside, this grassy green area. They're overlooking the lake. They, it is known for them to, anytime they go through a great uh, uh, miracle time, when they perform miracles or do great teaching, or when they're really worn out, they just get away. You know, that's scripture. And so Jesus and the disciples are worn out. They're up on the side of the mountain. They're kind of relaxing now, kind of refreshing, taking their, their, their Sabbath, if you would. And, and all of a sudden, 5,000 people come up. Now, 
we'll know later on in the text how the disciples feel toward them. But we know Jesus sees these people who are coming up, this 5,000, that they are an opportunity to be used for a miracle. And, and the thing is this, Jesus already knows, see we know from Scripture that, hey, there's a problem ahead. We know that because we, we know ahead of the Scripture or we already have it in written. The disciples don't have this knowledge. And so as Jesus is looking at them, Jesus has already, God has already put people in place to take care of the problem that's lying ahead of them. What is it? 5,000 hungry people. So they've come up, plus women and children. They have come up. Jesus sees an opportunity. But the disciples, as we'll see, sees it as a problem. And the problem, as we'll see here, is the same thing you and I have. It's not that can God do the miracle. We've seen God do miracles in our life, or in other people's lives at least, or we've heard of those miracles. We have them written in the text. We know Jesus can take care of the problem. We know that he can, that he might take care of the problem. The dilemma for us and the dilemma for the disciples here in this story isn't can he, isn't will he. The dilemma is this, can we trust him in the meantime? Can we trust our Heavenly Father when everything doesn't seem to go our way, when things don't always work out the way we want? Can we trust Him? And so Jesus sees this opportunity. The disciples see a problem. And notice what happens in verse 5. He, crumbs, he grabs Philip, and I could just picture him putting his arm around Philip, saying, Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Philip, where are we going to get bread that they may eat, as he points to the 5,000. And, you know, in other words, Philip, where are we going to get some food? Have you ever asked your kids a question and you already knew the answer to that question, but you wanted to see if they've learned from prior experience? You know, hey, did you take the cookie? No, I didn't take the cookie and got chocolate all smeared all over his face. But the consequences from the last time they lied, you want to see if they've learned from that? You know they've taken the cookie. I mean, the evidence is all over. The disciples should know the, the answer to this, because they've seen Jesus work time and time again. And so Jesus is asking this, not because Jesus doesn't know how to take care of the problem. That's not the issue. Jesus tells us in later in 6, in verse 6, that, hey, that's why he asked Philip, because he wants to see if Philip has learned from prior experience. Philip, where are we going to get some bread? And I can't help but think, if I'm Philip, I would be thinking, hold on, time out, Jesus. When did they become my responsibility? I didn't ask them to come up here. Matter of fact, Jesus, it's your fault. Because you've been doing miracles time and time again, and you haven't failed anybody yet. So they're just tracking you. They're following and tracking you to see if you'll do something for them. So if you would just mess up a little bit, they wouldn't follow us so much. And besides, we came up here to rest. We've done enough miracles down at the lake we're not coming up here to rest. I am tired of doing all that. Why are they? You got 11 other disciples, Jesus. Why me? Only thing is, we don't say it like that in our churches today. We say, you know what? I've given enough already, God. God, I've done enough already. When's someone else going to do someone, something about that? The disciple, the, Paul, Jesus had 11 other guys, but he picked up Philip. I can't help but think that God will only ask those who are near to him to do things greater than themselves. And so he pulls up Philip, and he has Philip. Philip, we can do a miracle for these 5,000. Could it be possible that this morning the problem you're facing isn't a problem, though I'm not belittling it, but could it be that it's an opportunity for God to showcase his glory through your darkest hour today? I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you came from or what's on the horizon. I don't know what you're waiting on. But could it be possible? See, here's the thing. We want God to showcase his glory in, in, in our success. We want to be that guy who crosses the end zone with the football in one hand and the finger in the other going, man, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. We want to be the one on the stage with all the spotlight. We want to be the one that makes that deal and makes that sales. But man, God forbid that God, you showcase your glory from my hospital bed. God forbid that you showcase your glory through my weakness. God forbid you showcase your glory through my baggage, through my pain, through my hurt. You see, God already knows, and God has already set in motion how he's going to do the miracle. 
But what's interesting, especially in our Christian realm and if you grew up in church, is sometimes we read through Scripture so fast that we miss the very thing God has for us. And I did that when I was going over and over John chapter 6 and just kept one things in seminary. They kept saying, keep reading the text. Read it again. Read it again. And God and the Holy Spirit just woke me and opened my eyes to, a, to this verse in John chapter 6 that brings all of this to light. And if it's anything, gives us some comfort for today through the things we're going through. Notice what he says to Philip, verse 5. Whence shall, what's the next word? We. Philip, where are we going to get some bread? Where are we? I'm, Philip, I'm not asking you to do this on your own. I'm saying, join me. Join Christ in doing the miracle. I'm not asking you. I know you can't do it on your own. So where are we? He makes it plural. What Philip does and what we do is we don't make it about we, God and I. We make it about what? me. It's no longer about we. God, I, yeah, I know you can take care of this issue. I know you can provide for this. I've seen you do miracles. I've seen you do it in other people's lives. But for me right now, huh? I got to see if I have enough to take care of it. I got to see if I, I, I can do it. And may I encourage you that God will never call you to be a solution to a problem or to a need and just leave you alone. When we went to Ethiopia, he didn't ride on the plane with us, and we landed in Addis and got to the edge of the door, and like, whoa, this is too much for me. Dwayne and Tammy, have fun with that. I'm heading to Cancun. Enjoy yourself. And out the door. He has already gone before us. He's with us, and he'll go before us ahead. And what's interesting is this, and can I just burst our Christian bubble this morning? God doesn't need us. He didn't need Philip to do the miracle. He wanted Philip to be a part of the miracle. God doesn't need you and I to perform or do any miracles around this world. But isn't it humbling and encouraging to know that the God of this world, the one who created everything, wants you and I to be a part of this. Now keep in mind, Philip's a disciple, yeah? He's what we long to be, what we, follow, we want to follow, be a follower of Christ, and there's nothing wrong with that, and we want to do that. And, and so Philip has already spent some time with Jesus. Philip's already experienced Jesus' faithfulness time and time again. Philip has seen Jesus' miracles and power and all the things that Jesus has done in towns prior to this. So when, when Jesus comes up to Philip and says, hey, Philip, where are we going to get some bread? It should not be shocking to us. Philip's response in verse 7 is, oh, Jesus, you want to feed these 5,000? I've seen you do miracles time and time again, and so we're going to take care of this miracle because, Jesus, I've seen you turn water into wine, and I've seen where you've taken mud and, and you put it on a blind man's eyes, and he got up and he walked again, and, and I've seen where you got down in dirt and you wrote about grace and forgiveness to a woman who should have been stoned, and Jesus, oh, your miracle, oh, man, Jesus, your voice. Oh, your very voice can calm the seas, a, a raging sea. And with that same voice, you called out demons, and demons obey your voice. And with your voice, oh, you called out Lazarus out of a grave. So Jesus, feeding these 5,000 is no issue to you or no issue to me, even because I've seen you be faithful. I've seen you in the past. I know your power. I know what you can do. So let me go get some bread, and I'm going to set out a buffet that will embarrass any Baptist. You'd think that'd be Philip's response, don't you? Because he's seen God do miracles time and time again. This is nothing to his heavenly Father. But notice Philip's response in verse 7. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. You see what happened there? Philip went from we to me. And in the process, Philip started opening up his lunchbox, or if you would, he reached in his pocket and he pulled out the possessions that he had. And here's what Philip came to the conclusion. Basically, Philip is saying, God, since I don't have enough, you're not powerful enough. God, since I don't have enough education, since I don't have enough finances, since I don't have enough talent, since I don't have enough experience, since I don't have, since I, 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 since I can't do this, 
neither can you. In other words, Philip was saying, my possessions determine God's power. We don't determine God's power based on our possessions. And Philip, a disciple, missed it. He had the opportunity to be used of God. And instead of saying, God, I trust your power because I've seen it. I know out of experience. I know. And we have the scriptures today that we can base our belief on. We have the scriptures to say, hey, I've seen you not only do it for me, but in others. But even in the scriptures, you've done it. We don't determine God's power based on our possessions. Now, here's where the story gets kind of even more comical. Philip just failed. And if you know anything about the disciples, they like to jockey for position, if you would. They like to, you know, there's a, the argument, who's going to sit on the right hand of Jesus? Who's going to sit on the left hand of Jesus? And, and, you know, they always wanted to see who's going to do it. And again, remember, there's 11 other disciples there with Jesus. And I can't help but think, when, when Philip pulled out that coin, those coins and started counting and realized, and, and I think as he was counting, he was looking at the, the, the problem, if you would, and he was looking at his possessions, but he didn't look at the power of God, and, and he started going through that, and he kind of flunked that faith test, and you know, he kind of walks off the scene. I can't help but think when Jesus looked over the other 11, the other 11 were going, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact, you know, because they saw that happen. But there's Andrew, and again, these disciples jockeyed for position. Andrew's off to the side, and, and in the story, Andrew reminds me a little bit of Eeyore off Winnie the Pooh, right? Because he's off to the side, and at the first scene, you got Jesus and Philip. Jesus' is arm around Philip. Hey, Philip, where are we going to get some bread? That didn't happen. Uh, Andrew, I almost called him Eeyore. Andrew's off to the side again, and he's watching all this, and he's like, ha ha, my time to leap over Philip to be the better disciple. So Andrew steps in, hey, Jesus, hey, there's a boy here, all right? We can, and I think as he's looking at Jesus, as he's looking at the, the, the boy, the lad, he catches a glimpse of the 5,000 women and children and, and men, and he's going back and forth, and he keeps looking, and he says, hey, Jesus, and he tells us here in verse 7, or in verse 7, or verse 8, I'm sorry, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, verse 9, there's a boy here, there's a lad here. And he has, and again, I can just picture Andrew, Jesus, we got this taken care of here. This boy, he's got five, one, two, three, four, five. And he's got, and I think as he was just starting to count the fish, that Eeyore kicked in him. He's got about one, two, three, four, five loaves, and he's got one, two. But what are they to so many? And just kind of walks off the story, right? And we don't hear from him again. Two disciples, followers of Christ, believers. Those who experience God's power, God's faithfulness, missed it. We do that today, don't we? When God asks us to do something bigger than us, we run to our lunchbox. We run to our, but God, I don't have the education. I don't, God, do you know my background? Do you know my history? Do you know what I did last weekend, last week? Do you know what I plan doing? Do you, God, you've got the wrong person. Get someone with a better lunchbox. He'll take you to a buffet. But we do that, don't we? Nine years ago, we arrived in Ethiopia. And at the time, they weren't giving out new spiritual missionary work permits to new missionaries coming into the country. And so we had to find a new way to get in. And God opened up the doors through an Ethiopian friend to come in under a medical uh, work permit. You know how much medical experience I have? Zero. All right. And so, again, that's a God thing. And so God got us into the country. And, and it wasn't long after we were there, he, our Ethiopian friend had contacted us and said, hey, listen, they changed some rules here in the, in the government and some laws. And so you can't come here. You can't be here under a medical work permit because you have no medical experience. We've been telling you that since the day we arrived. And, and uh, so I said, hey, what would you recommend? He said, you have two choices. You got to find another route to be able to stay long term or you have to leave the country. And I said, man, we came, we, we're not ready to leave. We know God's called us here to plant churches and train nationals to go start churches and disciple and, and all that. And he said, well, you need to find a, a way to stay long term. And, I, and he has a lot, of, of course, he lives there, but a lot of experience. I said, Dad, what would you recommend? He said, I highly recommend you get involved in some kind of education, whether you start a school, take over a school or something like that, and go that route. Because the government will be kind to you and work with you. And then as doors open, maybe we can start the church later on. And, I, and here's the thing, and this is, this is what scared me in that whole deal. I dropped out of high school my junior year. I'm not an educator. 
I can barely get the English language down, let alone another country language down that has 90 different languages in the country. I can barely get it. Y'all did great on that song, so y'all need to come with me, all right? You'll help me out. But I'm not an educator. And the fear set in, and, but we knew if we were going to stay, we had to go that route. And so Dell, we took it. I said, hey, take us, you know, see some property. And we went outside the city about two hours where we currently live now. And we came to this 10,000 square meter property. And it was an old school, had a bad reputation. It was about ready to shut down, had about 60 students, 70 students uh, enrolled there. And I mean, the grass was this high. It was so high that the only way I knew there were students there running around is I saw the wave of the grass as they were running around the place. And I'm like, I think there's a kid running through there and kind of deal. And the teachers, there's only three or four of them. They weren't doing very well. They just kind of did themselves. And and so Dawit, he's a, he's a visionary and goal setting guy. And I thought I was too. And he walks on the property and he's like, what do you think? And I remember looking at him and looking out there, and I thought, Dowie, what's it going to cost to get this thing up to where we need it to go, to where it's you know, self-functioning and everything? And he's still standing there like this, and, and he shot out a number, and I pulled a Philip. It's impossible, Dowie. It's not going to happen. And I'll never forget what Dowie said. As he was, he's only like four foot tall, and he's just standing there like this. And, and I said, Dowie, it's impossible. And he turned and he looked at me and said, Dwayne, where's your faith? You haven't even prayed about it yet. I said, okay, Dalweed, I'll pray about it. But the answer is no, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. I want you to see through our video what God has done through that school that we had taken and formed eight years ago. your faith. (laughs) 
our school this fall will enroll over a thousand students up to the eighth grade still with a waiting list but I always go back to that property and I stand at the gate and it's always that still small voice from God that says impossible is not in my vocabulary he's not done doing miracles through that school, as you've seen, we were able to start the Bethel Bible Baptist Church and our soccer ministry, which has exploded with about 120 young people every weekend coming out to our sports ministries. And so now we're on the endeavor of trying to buy property. And we started to look for property a couple years ago, and we came across, we're trying to get about two or three acres, and we started to price it. And around our area, in the rural area that we live, we came across for an acre of land about 150000 U.S. dollars. I did the exact same thing. It's impossible. But wait, God just did it all eight years and even all those other times. So many stories about our well, how I could go into a great story of how God took care of our well and the power and the buildings and the students and those who got saved in our school and teachers who are now working at our church who got saved through the school. And God, you've done all those cool things, but 150000 an acre, God? Hold on, let me see. If I have it, don't have it. It's impossible. We came back to the States to start this project and to raise funds, and we've been doing it for a couple years, but in the first six months, counting today what you guys have given, God has given us over $206,000 to the $250,000 we're trying to raise for the land. Now, God. The hero in this story outside of Jesus isn't a disciple. It isn't the ones we long to be like. It isn't the ones that the religious will, will build uh, buildings and mountains and, and idol and, and worship them. It's not them. It's a boy with very little who was doing the normal thing and God used him. The boy was not an accident. The boy, I believe, was strategically and purposely placed where he was for God to do a miracle through him. But here's the thing that's true for you and it's true for I. God can never do a miracle through you until you let him do a miracle in you. Until you give him your lunchbox and say, God, there's not a whole lot in here. And I know what some of you are thinking, man, I walked in here this morning, I don't even have a lunchbox. I don't even have nothing to put my junk in. It's when we give it all to God and say, God, here it is. You've got to do a miracle in me so you can do a miracle through me. As we finish out the story, we come to verse 10, and Jesus said, make the men sit down. I think he made them sit down because they weren't about to believe what was going to take place. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in the number about 5,000. Verse 11, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed it to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise to the fishes as much as they would. And this is so cool. Verse 12, when they were filled. Man, I love that. That means they went over their flex points for the week. They got knocked out of ketosis that day, right? I mean, they went out of bounds. And, and, but I love it. When they were filled. In other words, Jesus could have kept going. And God can keep doing things in and through your life. It's when we come to capacity that God says, okay, you're filled. When they were filled, he said unto the disciples, the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled. And I love this. How many baskets? Twelve. How many disciples does Jesus have with him? Twelve. I think Jesus just went around and handed every single one of those disciples a basket and they went out into the crowd and they gathered as much as they could and they come walking back and they're balancing, trying not to spill any of it and they stood there in line and Jesus made every one of them look at their basket and they looked at Jesus and Jesus just kind of went, told you so, and walked off. There's a few things I'd like for us to learn from this lad this morning. Four things and we'll be done. Number one is this. What can we learn from the lad? Number one, God gives us more than we'll ever need. If you live 
within the borders of the United States of America. You are blessed. I can't help my mind is just flooded with our family and friends in Ethiopia who would give anything to be where you are right now, no matter what you've got. We've been so blessed. The first time we arrived back from Ethiopia after being there for a few years, and we walked into Walmart, and we went to the bread aisle, and we lost it because we couldn't believe the abundance that was around and the choices we've had. And, and, and I grew up in it. Our greatest need in America and around the world and in Ethiopia isn't a physical need. It's not a nutritional need. The greatest need for all of America and around the world is a spiritual need. And to the winner goes our children and our grandchildren. That's a freebie. Second thing, we can learn from the lad. What we have right now, God can use to make an impact for the kingdom right now. But Dwayne, you don't know what I got in my lunchbox. I do know this. Whatever you have, God can use right now to make an impact for the kingdom right now. As we travel the states and we go to great churches like yours, and there's a billboard that I see in just about every single state, and the numbers change, but the billboard's always the same, and, and it's the, the, the lottery number, the, the jackpot number, like 200-something million. Now, I don't play the, the lottery. Do not encourage it at all, but if you play it and you win it, don't forget your pastor and I. Uh, you know, we're in a building project, and, uh, uh, but you know, I look at that sometimes, and it's like, wow, $200 million dollars. God, if you give us that, what we could do in Ethiopia with $200 million. And he constantly reminds me, he doesn't need that to do what he wants to get done. Thirdly, what can we learn from this lad? He lived with an open hand and an open heart. C.S. Lewis once wrote, a man whose hands are full of parcels can't receive a gift. Man, us Americans, I, I, I remind myself and, and many that I come across with, it reminds me a lot of the uh, Finding Nemo, the birds out of Finding Nemo, right? Mine, 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 mine. And, and if you don't think we're like that, I'll see you Thursday or the Friday after Thanksgiving shopping. You see how we respond. But we live a life so, so much about our possessions and what we do and what we succeed and, and all that that we can miss the very thing that God has for us. Lastly is this, and it's found in verse 14. Why is this story even in the Bible? Why are you where you are today? Why are you in the job that you think isn't the job, it's the one you're waiting for? Why are you in the family that you didn't ask for, or or you thought he'd stick around, or she'd stick around, and now you're raising the kids, and you're working three jobs, and why is it that God allows those things? Why is it that God puts you in those positions? And the answer is found in verse 14. Then those men, who, the men that didn't believe, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of truth, that the prophet should come into the world. Translation, there's our Messiah. There's the Messiah. Why do we do what we do? Why did God strategically place you in that job, in that school, in that subdivision, in that apartment complex, so that others may see who the Messiah truly is. Could it be possible that this morning or in your season of life right now, God wants to work in you so he can do a miracle through you that others may know him? So let me ask you this question as we close. Who's waiting on you? Who's waiting on you? Is it that co-worker, that family member, that person you're around so much? The unique thing about this boy, this lad, he, we don't know his name. We, the other gospel writers, they don't even write about him. We don't know if he ever made it home and mama whipped on him because he didn't bring home the five loaves and two fishes. We don't know if Jesus gave him one of the baskets and said, hey, take more home. We don't know anything else about him. But what we do know about him is he had more than he ever needed for one person. That God let him have, God used what he had at that moment to make a miracle. He lived with an open hand and open heart. And because he gave his lunchbox, gave everything he had to Christ that day, others came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ that impact their life for not only that day, but for all eternity. With every head bowed and every eye closed, 
I don't know what you came in with this morning in your lunchbox. You may have filet mignon stacked up in there, but you might have a fried bologna sandwich. Some of you, you're thinking, man, I don't even have a lunchbox. I ain't got jack, but I am jacked up. God will never do a miracle through you until he can do a miracle in you. The disciples wouldn't let him. Philip missed it because he looked at what he could do, not what God could do. Andrew missed it because he was relying on other people, on their resources, their possessions, not at God's power, but not the boy. Thank God for the lad. And I know the pushback because I've been there. The pushback is this. I'm scared. I'm scared that if I give God what I have, I'm afraid he'll ask me to do something that may have some consequences. What about my children? What about my job? What about my school? If I do what God is asking me to do, for me, moving to Ethiopia was an eight-year prayer, argument, fight out, drag out, fight with God. God, I don't want to go. We have children, and I don't want them living in that environment. If you get nothing else this morning, would you grab a hold of this? From what I've learned from Scripture and from what I've learned from experience, when we surrender to God, when we give God everything, we have placed the consequences of our decisions into the hands of an all-wise, almighty, all-powerful, all-loving God who will only do what is best for you. Who's waiting on you? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you know the hearts of the people. You know what they're carrying. Lord, you know the challenges on the horizon and through this text, Lord, you've already put things in motion to take care of those problems or those challenges that you see as an opportunity. God, for many of us here, let's just be honest, we're afraid. We're afraid of the consequences. We're afraid of what may happen if we give our life to you. We're afraid what others may think, what, what may happen if we stand up for you, if we share the good news, the miracles you've done in our own life, of how people may respond. But God, may this morning your Holy Spirit move like it's never moved before. May you continue to use this church greater than it's ever dreamed it could be used for your glory. And God, at this moment, would we just give it to you and let you do what only you can. In Jesus' name. Let's stand. Kathy continues to play. If you believe God, if you bow your heads, close your eyes. If you believe God has called you to come pray about something here at our altar, this is your opportunity. We do this at all of our morning services. So if you believe God's called you to come and talk to him about something, this is your chance. Come right now. Just leave your seat. Come to the front. Kneel at the altar. Do business with God. Talk to him. This is your opportunity to make things right, to ask God to surrender perhaps, as our missionary preached about. What's God calling you to do? There are some who've come to pray. Do you need to come? sing a verse together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided 
to follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Thank you. You may be seated. Brother Dwayne, we're going to let you go ahead. Your wife is already out at your table. So on your way out today, they have a table set up on the right side as you go out. You can grab a prayer card, and uh, you can talk to them more about the country of Ethiopia. But if you would like to learn even more about the country of Ethiopia tonight, come back at 6 o'clock. Uh, we're going to let them uh, do a little bit of uh, storytelling about their uh, endeavors on the mission field. Uh, Miss Tammy's going to be giving her testimony as well about how God called her into missions. And uh, so we hope that you will come back at 6 p.m. for our evening service. And so we've asked uh, before we go today and then after our prayer, so Stan Jensen, would you come? He's going to pray for our offering. And then after this is a video about uh, a prayer. It's called prayercast.com that, that we placed this, pulled this video from. And it's about the country of Ethiopia. It is an Ethiopian man praying for his country. So I think you'll enjoy that. Very moving. So Stan, please lead us. Father, we thank you so much for the chance to uh, hear this message this morning. And uh, even though, like was said, maybe we're afraid, but give us the courage to overcome that fear and to trust you, whether it's uh, ministering to family members or neighbors or uh, throughout the world. And uh, Continue to solidify the call of God in our lives and continue to uh, prompt us, enable us, and uh, gift us to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you for your goodness, for your love, and for your mercy. We want to thank you also for our Lord Jesus Christ, for the love of the cross. We just want to lift up our country, Ethiopia, into your presence. We want to thank you for the current situation in Ethiopia. We want to thank you, Father, for the sustained and remarkable growth of evangelical numbers. We want to thank you also for the unity among believers, for the Bible is increasingly distributed and read in the entire country. We want to thank you also, Father, for the freedom to worship and to gather. And Father, we pray also for the different challenges in our country. We pray for the peace of the country with the challenge of hostilities with the neighbor countries of Eritrea and Somalia. We pray also for the corruption that has increased with the economic growth as the resources are accumulating in the hands of a few. We pray also for the better harvest, wise economic governance and outside assistance rightly applied. We pray also for the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and during the time of immense challenge for its unique culture, theology, and tradition. We pray also for a deep work of the Holy Spirit, the revitalization of this ancient church, its biblical heritage, and its spiritual legacy. We pray for revival to be sustained and for division and carnality to be avoided. We pray also for the effective means of generating income to support the kingdom workers. We pray for the unity and cooperation among denominations. We pray against the dividing influence of the enemy and the human pride. We pray also for the mission vision which entails churches in all the regions of the country and even sending to the Horn of Africa, Middle East and Asia. 
We just want to lift up our country, Ethiopia, into your presence. There's nothing like hearing someone from that country pray for their country. I love those. So I hope that you will be praying for our missionaries in particular today. Uh, when you sit down to dinner today, perhaps remember to pray for Ethiopia, for the rights, and for the gospel to be presented to people there. We hope that you're able to come back at 6 p.m. tonight again. The rights, Tammy will be giving a testimony. Uh, Brother Dwayne will be sharing some stories and pictures from the field. This is just a great and unique opportunity to be able to kind of rub elbows with missionaries in that way. So we hope that you can make it back. If you've been our first-time guest, thanks so much for coming. On your way out at our Welcome Center, we have a gift bag for you. We'd love for you to pick that up on your way out. But if you can't come back tonight and we don't see you the rest of the week, we hope to see you next time. God bless you. Have a great day with the Lord.